members of our team, and Sabrina, I'm sorry, I'm now turning on the other microphone, so Thank I can you. have that too. Slide. Um, the other direction. So uh, maybe a little bit of a uh, the uh, back one. Um, there we go. Uh, so they're supposed to stand out in white, the people that are actually here. But maybe I can ask people to stand up. I'd first like to introduce Jennifer if she's in the room. Jennifer, are you here? Jennifer, oh, she's bolted. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, so we'll introduce Jennifer uh, again later. Jennifer is really uh, taking charge of organizing this, and so we really want to especially acknowledge her. I'll also uh, have Catherine stand up or wave your arms. So Catherine is involved in a, many, many different aspects of our program and is uh, instrumental in a lot of what's going on with myotonic dystrophy. So everybody who's here is fair game to kind of corner and talk to about what they're doing and what we're doing. Uh, so Jacinda is going to talk later and Jacinda's in the back and has stood up quickly and waved, but she'll, you'll see her later and uh, you can corner her. Um, and, uh, and then Tina is here and going to talk as well as Janice is here, I think. Is Janice here? There's Janice. So physical and occupational therapy. And so please feel free to corner anybody. And then there are a number of members of our research team. So uh, Sabrina is helping man the video camera. And uh, Bona, I saw earlier out front. She's still out front. And Leslie is in the back. And um, again, I, I hope you can feel free to contact anybody and talk about um, things that are of interest to you. So if we go to the next slide, the other thing that we are uh, really trying to do in this series of talks and meetings is to connect up with the investigators and clinicians around the state. We think we can only do this if we really work together, and so we're excited to work with Tassin Mosafar down at UC Irvine. Uh, over, he was at the last two meetings, and we've had representatives of the UC Davis uh, group at last year's meeting, as well as Eric Henriksen is here today and someplace. And will, Eric, are you, there you are. So Eric, uh, so UC Davis is one of the premier centers for neuromuscular disease in the world. So those of you in Sacramento are very lucky to have them here, and we really try to work very closely uh, with them on a number of different studies, including myotonic dystrophy. And then uh, Carla is here. Uh, Carla Grossman is here from UC San Diego and will be uh, available to meet with you during the day and answer questions. And then we're planning on doing next year's conference in San Diego so we can meet another side of the community down there. <laughs> this scattering of applause. Um, so it's very important for us. And then there are members of the community that have really stepped up and helped us this year, Penny Warford and Rob Bessicker. Uh, and we're really grateful uh, to you all for helping organize this meeting. Uh, so. I, I gave myself a half hour to talk about all of myotonic dystrophy and our research. So um, obviously we're behind schedule already, but just to briefly go over this, it's, it's a challenge because we have some of you old guard who have been at our meetings now for several years, as well as knowing a lot before you came to them. And you're, you're all very savvy, but we have new members of the community as well. And I think that not everybody understands fully what myotonic dystrophy means. And so myotonic dystrophy is the most complex of disorders. It's named after its effects on muscle, but it has many, many, many other effects that you may or may not realize are part of one underlying condition. So if you go to the next slide. So this is a family of mine that I worked with when I was in Minnesota. Look at that, look at that, how fancy. Um, and it, it, it kind of exemplifies a lot of what you all know about myotonic dystrophy. Many families come to light when an, an affected infant is born, 
and then we can see elements of myotonic dystrophy in mom and in mom's mom and mom's mom's brother and mom's brother and all of a sudden a lot of things become clear and this uh, this happens time and time and time again where we will find myotonic dystrophy in the family and then realize uh, that it's actually affecting many family members maybe not all in the same way many in different ways but that's kind of what uh, why we focus so much on trying to provide a, a comprehensive home for people with myotonic dystrophy so just to go through the elements of myotonic dystrophy uh, extremely briefly so myotonic dystrophy affects the skin and the hair there are many effects there and we could spend you know two hours just talking about the effects on the hair and skin it affects the eyes and the eyelids it's unusual amongst muscle diseases because it, it not only causes weakness of eye opening but it causes weakness of eye closure so you get the combination of effects uh, which end up causing unique issues so many people with myotonic dystrophy have dry eyes some people with myotonic dystrophy have excess tearing. So it just shows you the, the, the range that this can go. It gets very complex, as well as having effects on the lens, as we all know, with cataracts. I'm increasingly interested. I've seen now a few people with what's called Fuchs dystrophy. It's a change in the cornea of the eye. And if you or any family member has that, I'd be interested to hear about it because it's something that we're particularly uh, tracking uh, because of the underlying genetic changes. Hearing is probably affected. It's a very understudied element of myotonic dystrophy. Myotonic dystrophy affects chewing, swallowing. It affects the mouth in general, the structure of the mouth. It can be difficult in some individuals to get accurate or adequate dental care. It can be necessary to consider different kinds of reconstructive surgery in order to facilitate improved speech. Uh, so again, none of these things affect everybody. And you might very well be spared or members of your family about anything I talk about, but it can. It can affect a number of different things. It can affect the throat, the voice, and swallowing in many ways. Things might go down the wrong pipe. Things might not go down at all. They might get stuck. Things might get stuck at the top. Things might get stuck at the bottom of the esophagus. So it causes a number of different things. It affects breathing and coughing. It, it needs to be supported or investigated in various ways. It affects the heart function. So that one of the key elements, I tell everybody who has the myotonic dystrophy change is to please at least get an EKG done every year so that we know if there are changes that are starting that we can see because that's something we can do something about. It affects the stomach and the bowel. My goodness, we could spend days on this, actually, because of all the effects. And it's an area that we have a particular interest in at Stanford, where we're trying to understand this in a more basic way, but also to come up with various treatments uh, that work, whether we have to import them from France or if they're actually available uh, here in the US. Uh, so that you know, we're, we're, our ears are open. I mean, all too often, knowledge and understanding about myotonic dystrophy comes from you all. So we're kind of pikers in terms of understanding the complexity of myotonic dystrophy and we're eager to hear your new insights or understandings or ideas about uh, issues that we should be addressing. It affects the liver and the bile so that gallstones are very common. There's an increased chance of getting gallstones and increased risk of needing your gallbladder removed. It might be that if we're on top of that, we can do something about it ahead of time, that we, there are uh, treatments available that we might be able to use to prevent the development of gallstones if we're thinking about it early enough. And then it affects the muscle. I mean, I got all the way to the end of that list without mentioning the effects on muscle. And obviously, there are many. There, it can cause stiffness. It can cause weakness. It can cause pain. And it can cause just atrophy of the muscles. The muscles can shrink in size or in some people, they just never get very big. All of these things then also kind of are affected by broader changes, hard to pinpoint. There are changes in hormones, so that there are changes in the way insulin works, there are changes in the way testosterone works, there are changes in the way 
thyroid hormone works or, or parathyroid hormone works. So there are a number of things that kind of globally affect the system. There's some changes in the blood that can have uh, effects and there are changes in sleep. This is a big one for a lot of people that we work with. Sleep is a huge problem, but it's complicated. So it can be affected by breathing. It can be affected by hormones. If your stomach is aching, you're not sleeping well. If you have muscle pain, you're not sleeping well. Causes of sleep disruption are many and uh, need to be dealt with in a comprehensive way. And then a lot of people focus on the, the thinking side of myotonic dystrophy. It does not cause dementia in the way that Alzheimer's does, but it can make thinking difficult. It can, in some people, make thinking hard. It's hard to plan, it's hard to organize, it's hard to, to carry out the tasks that you previously were able to carry out. So it can be complicated, but even that, that thinking side of it is complicated because it's affected by everything else. So again, if you're not eating well, if your stomach isn't eating well, then you're not thinking well. If you're not sleeping well, you're not thinking well. If you have pain, you're not thinking well. You can see how complicated this can get, but there is, we do believe, a central nervous system component to this, and I could easily spend the day talking with you about where we're at with that and what we're trying to understand and where we're going with our understanding of that side of myotonic dystrophy. Because this all plays into the research. So one of the, we, we can do so much more the more people with myotonic dystrophy that we are able to work with. The more we are able to connect up to the community, we're going to learn more from you what's important. We're going to be able to get the research done more quickly. So there should be probably upwards of between five and 10,000 people with myotonic dystrophy in California alone. It isn't that rare a disease or condition. Um, and the more people that we can work with, the faster we can move this forward. We do think we're on the verge of making some headway in terms of controlling this, and we're eager to work with you uh, to accomplish that as rapidly as possible. And there's just a lot of work yet to be done. And we'll, we'll hear more about that um, momentarily. So if you're interested, if you're able, some of the first things to do are to get connected with the registries. So the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation registry uh, is available on the web. You can sign up, you can keep updated on that. You'll get information back as well as providing information that allows us and investigators around the world to connect with you so we can move the research forward. The University of Rochester has a national registry. It's a different registry for different purposes. You can connect up with both of them. I encourage you to because that information is used differently. We have our own database and uh, the uh, folks in, and, uh, from our team um, are happy to get you enrolled if you're not already. Um, and they're here today and there are um, actually some research uh, opportunities that you could partake in uh, right away, just uh, filling out some questionnaires or uh, signing up for upcoming studies. Some of the things that we are doing, and Catherine will uh, lead a breakout session on this later on uh, today, is our biobank where we're eager to get specimens if you're undergoing any kind of operation. Uh, we would love to get any tissue that is otherwise going to be thrown out um, so that we can save that and we share this with investigators around the world. So this isn't just for Stanford, this is for anybody doing myotonic dystrophy research. Um, just had a paper published uh, f uh, from a, with a group in France on one aspect of cardiac function, for instance. So we're very eager to work with anybody. So if you have surgical specimens, sometimes we'll ask you if you would give a biopsy in certain circumstances. And once you're done using your body, if you wouldn't mind donating it, we would uh, take that as well. So we are eager to work with you to keep you happy, healthy, and kicking as long as possible. But for those of you who can think a step or two ahead, and are willing to uh, consider that, it's something we can get set up so you don't have to think about it at the time. So I don't want this to sound too ghoulish. You know, we are not eager for getting a lot of bodies quickly, but at the same time, we don't want to miss an opportunity if we can, because there are things that we can learn uh, from post-mortem tissue that we cannot learn in any other way. 
So don't be shy. If you, have a, if you have an interest, we can talk with you about that. And Catherine has some forms if you just want to take them with you. We are doing various studies. So we, we have a study right now looking at various aspects of childhood myotonic dystrophy uh, for children who are able to come in ages 8 to 17. Uh, we can put them through a study. I want to mention the importance of seeing unaffected children and unaffected adults. So if they're family members who do not have the myotonic dystrophy ge genetic change, or if they even carry it and don't have any symptoms, they might be of great value to us because we compare uh, people that have symptoms to those who don't have symptoms. It's of great value for us to tease apart exactly what's going on. So that's true for all of these studies. We have a primary em emphasis on sleep. We think that's going to be the window by which we can understand what's going on in the central nervous system better. Uh, we have a uh, focus on, on metabolism and energy so that fatigue is obviously a big part of myotonic dystrophy. And we're eager to work uh, with uh, the community to, to tease that apart better so we understand it, as well as the drug trials that are going on. And I'm going to largely leave that for Lori to talk about from Ionis, but just wanted to remind you, again, for those of you who are new to the community, the work that uh, Charles Thornton's lab has done uh, along with others and working with the Ionis Pharmaceuticals Company to get rid of, so that you probably can't see this, but there are red dots, basically, of the abnormal CTG or CUG uh, expansion and myotonic dystrophy that occur in almost every cell. And those red dots, those globs of RNA, end up being what is at least responsible for a large part of myotonic dystrophy. And this just shows that with treatment, with the antisense ionis pharmaceuticals compound, we are able to get rid of those red dots and using myotonia in muscle as a marker. This is in mice now. The, the, um, the muscle gets corrected and the myotonia goes away. So I don't want to belabor that. I, I think uh, Lori might talk about it a little bit more, but um, it, I did want to mention it because it is exciting. This is not a magic wand. This isn't going to come down and poof, make, make myotonic dystrophy go away. I wish it were that way. I wish that were going to happen. But in all likelihood, that's not going to happen. And I, I don't want to get too focused on one treatment. I want to be ready to come up with the next treatment and the next treatment and the next treatment so that we can really just keep this on the run. I think we, within the next couple of years, we're going to have myotonic dystrophy on the run. We are going to be pushing back on this. We are going to be making headway. We are already. And it's a tremendously exciting time. But I don't want everybody to think that this is going to be all over with one bomb or one, one you know, missile firing that really takes out a chunk of this. It's going to give us a start. It's going to give us a toehold that we can then build on and really conquer this. So we're in this for the long haul. We're eager to work with you. And uh, I really think that by joining the community together, we can, we can do a lot more together. So a lot of the, the purpose of today is meeting other people, talking with other people, uh, making some connections, connecting up with us, and connecting up with the members of the uh, California neuromuscular community. And with that in mind, I think I'm going to turn it over to Eric, um, who is going to talk about what some of the things that are going on, very exciting, at UC Davis. I think that's who I was supposed to turn it to. Did I? 